world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. How are you doing there? It is David. It's the weekly podcast. We are coming from the Set Theatre in Kilkenny. We're in the middle of the Kilkenomics Festival. It has been a hoot. And what's been really, really nice has been the amount of people who've come up to me and said, listen, we love the podcast. We're here because of the podcast. So thank you very, very much. We've had a bumper year. We've sold a huge amount of tickets. And it seems like we're Building a bit of a gang, a community out there, a podcast community. So Woo-hoo! thank you all very much. I'm here with John. I've dragged him in off the street. He's bedraggled and on top of his game. <laughs> How are you, Head? <laughs> bit of a fuzzy head, but what a weekend. What a weekend. Who's it's, your highlight? Well, I, I mean, there, there were many, John, but interviewing Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, yeah, in yeah, St. Yeah, Canis' yeah. Cathedral with 900, maybe 1,000 people in a gothic, a beautiful gothic cathedral, and listening to, for me, the best economist, not only of his generation, but maybe maybe the last close to 100 years. I mean, he's up there in my my view with Keynes. I mean, this is he's a really brilliant, brilliant wow, person. Yeah. But also, and again, for people interested in economics, if you're just coming to economics through the podcast for the first time and you're liking the stuff we do, uh, I cannot advise you more then to read early Krugman. There's a great book called The Accidental Theorist, uh, which he wrote in about 1995, which will explain economics brilliantly to you. Or there's a great book called The Return of Depression Economics, which he updated after the 2008 crisis. These are really fantastic. Right. Kind of touchstones of how to write economics, how to think about it. So, and also the lovely thing is everyone had warned me that he was really grumpy. And he turned out to be yeah. absolutely lovely. And the reason I'm, he told me, you know, I said, I didn't say to him, everyone, told, everyone said, said, you're grump and you're actually really nice, obviously. But uh, he said, no, I like doing things. He said, I do three gigs. He said, I do gigs that pay me really well. <laughs> he said, gigs the New York Times forced me to do by contract. And then he said, every couple of years, I do gigs that sound like fun. And he said, I read about, and the amazing thing is he read about Kilconomics. He said, I read about these Irish guys doing economics yeah. and comedy. He says, I like the sound of that, so I'm here. Fantastic. So he was in a good mood and then yeah. he was very generous. And, and what was what was brilliant about him as well was the way he was kind of interacting with the Yanis Varoufakis and Dan Ariely and Samantha Parr. Yeah. And the way with all those conversations going on was brilliant. Yeah, and we had a really interesting conversation last night with Dan Ariely, Yanis and Paul about how to make economics better. You would think, you know. That was a great session. A couple of years ago, you'd think would 20 people turn up to that? And there was about a thousand people in that room. Yeah. It was a, it was an extraordinary gig. So if you missed Kilconomics and you're just listening to us where, wherever you are, we have recorded many of these conversations with, for example, you know, Dan Ariely, again, fantastic stuff with Yanis Varoufakis, Samantha Power was fascinating, Obama's human rights advisor. A really interesting one was Betsy Stevenson, who was Obama's on Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, was the head of the U.S. Labor Department. She was fantastic. An amazing woman. I've always read her stuff. And again, emailed her during the year, asked her to come over. She said yes. So we have all these amazing conversations, I think really fascinating conversations, which we'll share with you on Patreon. And again, if you like our stuff, John, myself and JM, Love putting the the cast together, as you know. But again, as I said, it costs us quite a bit. And if you do fancy the stuff and you like what we do, we'd appreciate it greatly if you could support us and throw a a few quid our general direction to put in the kitty so that we can do more of this and bring more of these people over to Ireland or not even over to Ireland within our network so we can record conversations with them and share them. Because it's not always you get to talk to a Nobel Prize winner about leprechaun economics, which is what he was chatting about. (laughs) So again, support us on Patreon forward slash David McWilliams. It's patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. And we will reward you by bringing you the most interesting conversations with the most eclectic people. So, but let's go back to it, right? So what was really, really lovely about Krugman is... He was warm and he was generous with his ideas and he was funny, 
But of course, you're in the presence of real genius, you know, so everything he says is a little pearl of wisdom. And it was something he said to me, got me thinking about the the subject of this week's podcast. He said to me, it's interesting when I'm sitting to you here, we're chatting about the world 30 years to the day after the Berlin Wall came down, mm. which is today. And he said, it's very interesting. So the day after the Berlin Wall, he said, I rang a mate of mine who was uh, somebody originally from Central Europe, where Krugman's grandparents were from. And he said, that's great. He said, now uh, Europe has got rid of uh, communism. That's fantastic. He says, now we can get on with what we're really, really good at, fascism. (laughs) And what is interesting is 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it is fascism that's on the rise. Central Europe, in Western Europe, nationalism, populism, etc. So I want to talk about that, but I want to talk about the unintended consequences. Everybody expected when the Berlin Wall to come down that the countries that would benefit most were the countries of Central Europe and Continental Europe. And that didn't happen. And I want to talk about the countries that did benefit, one of which was Ireland, and the winners and losers in economics and why you think that you understand the world. And then a big event happens and you say, okay, well, this is going to lead to this and this is going to lead to that. And then 10 or 15 years later, something totally different is the upshot. So that's the subject. Brilliant. This week's- okay, so before we get into that, let's just have a quick listen to this. All three men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Reporting tonight from Berlin. From the Berlin Wall specifically. Take a look at them. They've been there since last night. They are here in the thousands. They are here in the tens of thousands. Occasionally they shout, Die Mauer muss weg, the wall must go. Thousands and thousands of West Germans come to make the point that the wall has suddenly become irrelevant. I've been looking for freedom. I've been looking so long. I've been looking for freedom. Who was that at the end? Believe it or not. That is our friend David Hasselhoff, the Knight Rider himself, Baywatch. The Hoff, man. The That's... Hoff. Well, I tell you, that bit is taken from him singing over that weekend of the Berlin Wall coming down from a cherry picker, a massive, massive crowd on the Berlin Wall. And there he was singing the Freedom Song. Ah, oh, brilliant. But listen, let's, let's, you've got to Google that. YouTube, that's going to be on YouTube. It's brilliant. But let me tell you one other thing about Springsteen. The year before, in 1988, Springsteen did a gig in Eastern Europe to 400,000 people. And he did a four-hour gig. There is no accounting for bad taste. But he, he had, you know, they say Look, he inspired the East Germans and, and down came the wall, rock the wall. and roll. So rock and roll brought down the world. But anyway, before we go any further on that, let's talk about Germany. Let's talk about that moment that the wall came down and then what it meant both in Germany, but in Central and Eastern Europe. Let's bring it back to Ireland. And you have a big theory on this. And then we look at all the other stuff. Krugman's... Sort of note about the yeah, rise of about fascism. fascism. Yeah. Well, I think, John, what, you know, what I've, I've always found fascinating about economics is the way which it shifts, that you think one thing's going to happen and then something totally different happens. Yeah. That's something that I'm always very, very well aware of. And it also cautions me about making these great, big statements about the future because, you know, sometimes you're blindsided. And I think the lesson of the fall of the Berlin Wall is one that we should heed in terms of what happens when a big event occurs, which people have been waiting for, albeit unexpected at the time, but you think 
this is going to lead to a chain of events that take us on this road. And in actual fact, it leads to a chain of events that take us on another road. So when the Berlin Wall fell, and I remember it distinctly at the time, the supposition was that the countries of around Germany, mm. particularly Eastern Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, that part of the world, right? Middle Europa, which used to be called Middle Europe, Middle Europe, Central Europe, would end up benefiting very quickly economically. And the idea was that they had well-educated industrial working class labor forces educated by the communists. And the communists may have been many things, but technocratically and technically they were very able. Second thing is a country like Czechoslovakia, for example, Czechoslovakia was the most industrialized country in Europe before the Second World War. Yeah, so they did so all the infrastructure. Huge industrial legacy. And you know the way people who do fitness, like Neil, when I do boxing, talks to me about <laughs> fucking muscle memory. I'm like, man, I have muscle amnesia. <laughs> I have no memory at all. But countries also have industrial memory. So that the idea was that these countries had this educated industrial class waiting to be liberated. Then investment funds would flow from the West. Those investment funds would be attracted in by two things. One is the wages were lower, yeah. number one. And two, that these countries were very close to the main market. The main market was always going to Germany yeah, or France, a big yeah. industrial... And big, the opening new market of and, Russia as well. and, and the opening new market of Russia. And that these countries and countries further to the East would get this massive, massive gain really quickly. And that th those gains would be permanent and that those were the countries that would benefit most from the end of communism sure. because those are the countries that were communist. Yeah. And if you believe that communism wasn't good for you, then you take communism away, then the gains would come most immediately and most permanently to the countries that were under communism for 40 years. That was the theory. But something else happened in practice. The country that actually did most spectacularly well in the 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall was not Eastern Germany or even Germany itself, was not Czechoslovakia, was not Poland, was not Slovakia, Hungary, any of these. It was Ireland. And the so, question is, how did Ireland, the country that at the time nobody mentioned, when the Berlin Wall came down, the only Irish people who twigged that this was a big moment were you too, and they actually went over and camped <laughs> there and, and produced Actung Baby. Yeah. Most Irish people said, oh, this is something in Germany, whatever. And certainly the rest of the world wasn't looking at Ireland. So the question is, if you look 30 years after the Berlin Wall came down, the country that has had the most significant increase in its income, the most significant increase in living standards, the most change industrial base, the biggest increase in immigration, which is always a good sign of dynamism, yeah. and a massive change to the middle class is Ireland. How did that happen when it wasn't expected? Yeah, okay, so now talk me through this, because this is, a, this is a curious one. It is a curious one. So. What happened was the Berlin Wall comes down. Everybody thinks, okay, Germany is now going to be a united country. Mm -hmm. A united Germany has historically had a weakness for going to the east. It was called the Dragnock Austin under Bismarck. Hitler called it something else. But the idea was that everyone thought Germany was going to pivot away from Western Europe and the European Union, which had glued it to the west yeah. since 1957 which was the Treaty of Rome, and then all the subsequent treaties in the European Union based around Brussels. The NATO members thought, hold on a second, I mean, NATO being Britain and America, thought, hold on a second, a unified Germany, we've got to figure out where that is militarily, because that was our buffer zone against the Soviet Union for 40 years. Yeah. Now what are we going to make of it? Th Thatcher had a particular disliking of Germany in general. Yeah, she had the... Mrs. Thatcher was was a, a war baby. She was a product of the Second World War yeah. in, in Britain, so she had a totally different... And they actually view. had taken in, a, a, I believe, a Jewish immigrant. They had taken in Jews, like a lot of British people did, the thing called the Kinder Transport, which got Jews out at the very, very end, yeah. in 1938, out of Austria and Germany. But the European Union said, OK, Germany's unified, what do we do? We've got to anchor the Germans back into Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So the price the Germans are going to pay for unification is going to be, they're going to have to give us their currency, right, the Deutschmark. So we're going to create the euro. So the French bureaucrats came up with the idea, which was basically on the back burner for ages of a euro. Nobody in Europe took it really seriously. The French said, this is our opportunity. We're going to convert Deutschmarks into euros. The euro is going to be the 
European currency was going to be based on the wealth of Germany and that's going to drag the Germans back to the mm. West. That was quite smart, I, but there's Mitterrand. That was Mitterrand. And, and then they also said, but if we're going to have Europe as a proper economic entity with Germany at its heart, we need a single European market. Mm. So in 1992, down came trade barriers, down came migratory barriers, all this sort of, it's called the internal market, right? So these two big things play out. And then the third thing is when communism goes... The GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, goes into overdrive. So you get this move towards free trade all over the world. Yeah. Now, what that meant, the free trade meant, was that basically you could invest wherever you want. This is all part of the story. And at the time, again, people thought, well, you know, who's going to benefit? It's going to be our friends in Eastern Europe. But Ireland benefited. And so what actually happened was when the single market opened up, Europe became a market of 320 million, soon to be 500 million people as we expanded to Eastern Europe. Yeah, That is gold dust for a large company. Everyone thought the American companies would come in and they would invest their, lo- their new European headquarters in Germany or Czech Republic or Hungary or Austria. Yeah, of course, yeah. They didn't. They picked Ireland. And this is the interesting thing, that American multinationals chose Europe but they chose Ireland as the location and nobody expected that. And the reason is that culture, English-speaking environment and our proximity to the Americans trumps economics always and taxes trumps location. That if you make things cheap for people, if you you can invest in Ireland and we're not going to tax you, then you do it. Now, the problem is the reason we didn't have to tax capital is we didn't have any capital base of our own. And if you don't have a capital base in your own and you cut your tax on capital to very, very low, you don't lose any money. Mm. Whereas if you're Germany or if you're any of the former Soviet countries, you have a capital base, you're generating tax from that. If you cut tax, you lose revenue. So they couldn't do it. So, we so this did first... this apply to, to the UK as well? Because, I mean, they the U- had the culture and the language Yeah, but as the, well. U- you, the UK has always had a very significant class war element in its politics. So it has taken the UK many, many years to cut corporation tax because the Labour Party traditionally would never cut corporation tax because it's a tax yeah. of fat cat capitalists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn. So we managed to engineer this situation where Ireland benefited much more than any European country from the fall of the Berlin Wall because American investment chose Ireland number one. That was, that's the first thing. The second thing then is the countries of Central and Eastern Europe saw not an inward migration of capital flowing in, but an outward migration of people, right? Okay. Bec- which is why Ireland is full of Polish people. Yeah. Why do you think this place is full of Lithuanians and Poles and Hungarians? Stonewashed jeans. Stonewashed jeans, mullets, <laughs> the whole thing going on, right? But we benefited enormously because what happened was, so the American capital comes in, It fuses with our educated labor force. It exports the stuff out to the European Union. When we start to run out of domestic workers who are domestic talent because Mm -hmm. we're so small, because we're in the European Union, because the Eastern Europeans are, are here, because they want to travel, they come here. So suddenly we get a brain drain coming from Eastern Europe and we get a brain gain in Ireland. This all happens over the first 15 years after the Berlin Wall falls down. So what you see then... And this, by the way, is after the brain drain of of the 80s. Of Irish people, yeah. Yeah, in the 80s. But also what you see, uh, and I'd say that uh, you and I were clearly part of the brain game to Ireland. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, we went away and we came back. So what you see is this perfect storm of positive impact in Ireland when nobody expected it. So had you said to somebody when... Ray Houghton put the ball in the English net. <laughs> this is the Necker Stadium, John, June 1988. I remember you, it well. When you were listening to that Springsteen geezer <laughs> and I was watching football, okay, if you had said in the next 30 years, Ireland is going to be a boom place and we'll go with ups and downs and booms and busts, but we're going to get rich, people would said, no way. Yeah. How come, right? And that's the interesting thing. So there's another layer in this story. When Germany, when communism falls in Europe, the Politburo in Beijing is watching all this. And they're watching the implosion of the Soviet Union. And they're watching the Soviet Union break up into its constituent parts. And they're watching the Communist Party disappear. And they're watching 
the Warsaw Pact, the military alliance, disappear and NATO moving towards the Baltics and yeah. towards the uh, bottom end of Ukraine. And the Chinese are saying, whatever the fuck happens, that's not going to happen to us. And this is not long after Tiananmen Square. This is two months after Tiananmen Square. Yeah. So they say, we are going to do the following. We realize that if we are weak, the Americans, the West, will destroy us. That's what they, their lesson was the Russians, the Soviets were weak. They weren't strong and they were destroyed. So we've got to get strong. How do we get strong? We create a manufacturing powerhouse in China. How do we do that? We do that without this democracy because the democracy makes you fragile. Would they start from scratch then? They were more or less starting from scratch. Right, okay. Because Mao Zedong had these crazy ideas of the Great Leap Forward, he had collectivization of agriculture. They were very, very... I mean, the Chinese were this, this ridiculously crippled economy driven by crazies like the Gang of Four. I mean, it was really extreme. People don't forget how extreme Maoism actually was. Yeah. But Deng Xiaoping came in and in 1981, he said something very interesting about how he was going to reconcile communism and capitalism and growth. And he said, and it was really cryptic and Chinese, he said at a, at a party speech, I don't care what the colour of the cat is, whether it's black or grey, as long as it catches the mouse. What does that mean? He meant, I don't care if we're a capitalist country or a communist country, as long as we generate the economic growth that will make us strong. And that's what he said, and that was understood by everybody to say, okay, let's go for it. And this was Deng Xiaoping opened up China. But, so the Chinese begin to start exporting basic manufacturing goods, okay? Who suffers when you export basic manufacturing goods? The countries that make basic manufacturing goods suffer yeah. from China. And the countries that make basic manufacturing goods were the communist countries of Central right. Europe. Okay. Who had these pretty bog standard cars, bog standard fridges and whatever. Suddenly, their old industrial base, which was the hope that they would expand rapidly and it was going to be the foundation for them to create these new societies, gets destroyed by what is called the China shock. And the China shock is the shock to trade that China has caused over the last 30 years, which is much, much worse in countries whose industries are competing with China. Now, think about Ireland. Ireland had no industry. We didn't have any existence. We were, as I've said in the podcast before, a beer and biscuits economy, right? Yeah. That basically we had agriculture and we had Jacob's biscuits and, and Guinnesses. And tourism. And Guinnesses and tourism, mm. right? Mm. The Chinese can't shock tourism. They can actually shock it only in a positive way by coming here. But let's go back to it, right? So the countries that had a significant manufacturing industry that were slightly fragile were made much more fragile by China. Case in point is Italy country that had a proper manufacturing base mm. with cars and watches and all sorts of high design goods. Italian manufacturing has been really badly affected by China. Now what happens then is if your high productivity manufacturing industry is badly affected by China, the people who depend on that your industrial middle class, yeah. your managerial class, your marketing departments, all these things associated with industry also get destroyed. So what you find is if you look at the research, there's an interesting American institute called the Pew Institute, which there's also survey data and research data. It's right. really well worth looking at. It's, 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 it's online if, if you're interested. The Pew Institute does really brilliant research. They've taken over the last 30 years the growth and decline of middle classes in Europe. And what they see is that the, by far and away, the biggest increase in the middle class has happened in Ireland from 1990 to uh, 2016. Right. And the middle class of Germany, Italy, France, Finland have all contracted. And the reason the German middle class contracted was because they got 18 million poor East Germans into Germany, which dragged down the average income. The Italian and French middle class has shrunk because Italian and French industry has shrunk. And likewise, the same in Finland. Finland had one company called Nokia. Mm -hmm. Nokia was a yeah. world beater and then it collapsed and it destroyed a huge part of the productive class. So Ireland has no industries that can be destroyed by China because we had no industries. But the American multinationals come in 
and they start to invest. Now, just to give you a figure on American multinational investment. Yeah. American multinational investment is now in Ireland. The accumulated total is over seven hundred and fifty billion dollars of investment. Holy moly! Two hundred and fifty percent of GDP. It is by far and away the most significant foreign direct investment figure in the world. Now, some of it is kind of Google, Jiggery, Fokery, and Facebook, but lots of it is Boston Scientific and Pfizer and Intel and all these yeah. proper companies. That's, that's just to put that in perspective, that $744 billion is more than what China has invested in all of Africa. Yeah. And I, I, it's I incredible. Th- so I don't think Irish people realise, because there's so much, at the moment criticism of the multinationals because for example like big tech for example these are these are these companies are now as, as toxic as big oil in in the past and the big banks in the past and, and they've become more toxic and we're kind of in the front line of this but we don't understand that there's sorry what do you mean by toxic well if you look at facebook i mean facebook has now been accused of being the single biggest purveyor okay, right, right. of fake news yeah they are being accused of robbing the tax base of lots and lots of countries they are being accused of amplifying inequality. So my I, own sense, and it's, mean, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a definitely a few podcasts in itself, is the changing nature and reputation of Silicon Valley. And we'll definitely go into that. Yeah, yeah. For Ireland, the problem is we're Silicon Valley in Europe because we are home to those countries, mm. companies. But while we talk a lot about Facebook and Google and LinkedIn and all these, there are other companies in Ireland. There's the Boston Scientifics, the Intel, the Pfizer. These are real companies employing many thousands. Your brother's employed more yeah. than you know. But tens of thousands of Irish people have got jobs in these multinationals, which has created a whole new class in the country of technically very able people who are competitive in the international world, who can actually work anywhere they want. And these people are the new industrial class. So as... Other parts of Europe's middle class shrunk because of globalization. Ireland's middle class expanded dramatically because of globalization. And this expansion of the middle class is, I believe, the reason that Ireland doesn't have a fascist party. And the rest of Europe is now dealing with fascism as the single most rampant political idea. And for some reason, and I believe the reason is economic, we don't have it. So imagine. The fall of the Berlin Wall doesn't lead to democracy and flourishing capitalism in Europe. It ends up with the threat of fascism, which we're seeing all over Europe. Right. The fall of the Berlin Wall in Ireland, which nobody thought was going to do everything, leads to a dramatic change in the middle class, a dramatic increase in living standards, and a political centre ground, which I call the radical centre, which has actually remained incredibly strong. So in a one way, what has happened over the last 30 years is Ireland has become an outlier, not just on economics, but also on politics. And it's the Krugman thing that interests me now, which is Europe is reverting to fascism as the legacy of what happened in Berlin 30 years ago. Mm, that's really interesting, actually. So come here to me then, just to recap on that. So 9th of November, 89, yeah. fall of the Berlin Wall. That led to a chain reaction where Central Europe, which is supposed to do well, went down. Doesn't do well. Doesn't do well. It does well, but not as well as expected. And the problem with politics, John, is that it's expectations determine things. If you're poor and you remain poor, your expectations haven't changed. If you're poor and you have been told for years and years and years, we are only poor because of communism. And you know what? Your grandfather and your great-grandfather, they lived in a rich country. And if we could only just get rid of this system, we're going to be rich. And we're going to be like the Germans. So the expectation in the winter of, of, let's say, 1990, 1991, all over Europe is, in a matter of years, we're going to be rich. Our expectation in Ireland was, in a matter of years, we're going to live in Brooklyn. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Or the Bronx, or, or London, right? So our expectation was down here because our previous history had been so terrible. Right, economically, their expectation was up here because their previous history, they felt their narrative was, we have been robbed of our mm. future because of communism. Now it's gone. So they expected to get rich. We expected to remain poor. We end up getting much richer than we expected, which actually changes the political atmosphere and people become more contented. Yeah. They, on the other hand, 
are dealing with anxiety, bitterness, frustration, and because of migration, a brain drain. So the intelligent people are leaving, leaving the less intelligent people, and the less intelligent people, the less open people, the less cosmopolitan people are much more likely to vote for fascist parties. Right, okay. So so that's one legacy. The second legacy is after 1989, China opened. China opened. Oh, China was unleashed on the world. And we get a positive China shock and they get a negative one. Right. They get a negative one because their old industry gets destroyed in the open market by cheaper Chinese products. We get a positive shock because American multinationals react to the China shock by doing two things. One is they amplify their overseas investments, mm -hmm. okay, because they want to actually get out of the United States and deal in the big world. That's the first thing. A huge disproportionate amount of that American investment comes to Ireland, as we said with those figures, the 700 odd billion, right? That builds a new industrial class that was never there. Because we didn't have an industrial class to be destroyed by China, we didn't get a negative shock. And we end up with an entirely new, what you would describe as industrial infrastructure built by Americans, worked in by Irish people. The wages go to Ireland. Some of the tax revenue comes to Ireland. Lots of the tax mm. revenue goes to shareholders. But that's the world we live in. Yeah. So we, we're getting all these positive shocks, but other countries are getting negative. And where you see this is in the body politic. Right. So are you saying then, just to be clear, that 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, we benefited hugely from that. Central Europe went down. China got a massive boost, but also it was the root of populism and indeed Brexit? Yes. I mean, you, like, the way I think about the world is always in big, big sweeps, big decade-long epochs. I don't think, you know, I never read the paper and say, okay, this is going to happen tomorrow. I just think, mm. okay, well, how is this going to play out? So the first thing is the China shock undermines everyone with a manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. a traditional manufacturing base. The two parts of the world that have traditional manufacturing, so the three parts of the world of traditional manufacturing base before China was Japan, Western Europe, and by mean Western Europe, I mean Britain as well, mm. and the United States. Japan goes into a slump in 1990 and hasn't got out of it. It has never, ever regained its manufacturing prowess. Why? Because lots and lots of Japanese industry has moved to China, just right. across. Yeah. Second thing, the United States has not recovered from the China shock because lots and lots of American industry can't compete with China, which is why you get Mr. Trump saying China, 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 yeah. China all the time. The third is what happened in Europe was that the countries, except for Germany, and this is the interesting, the Germans have been able to thus far exploit China. And the reason is the Germans export, as well as consumer goods, lots and lots of capital goods, machines that make machines. Right. And the machines that make machines are being exported to China to make machines. Right, okay. But the countries that didn't twig this, France, Italy, and Britain, have all suffered profoundly. And what happens when you suffer profoundly is you suffer a shock again to this idea of expectations. So if you are a British worker, right? And you and your dad and your dad's dad have worked in manufacturing for many, many years. And you've managed to survive the Thatcherite onslaught on British manufacturing, which was an internal suicide pact against themselves. Yeah. Crazy stuff, right? Yeah. Okay, no other country had ever done this. And in so doing, they threw millions of people in the north of England onto a permanent downward spiral of welfare and no jobs and bad education. I mean, an extraordinary thing to do. But they became the financial centre of Europe. Yeah, but... But so what? But so what? Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's jobs for, for Essex boys, okay? Yeah. I worked with them. I know all about <laughs> yeah. this, right? Uh, oh, how this all materialises, and again, politics doesn't change year after year. It changes very slowly. But slowly but surely, the idea of capitalism and the free markets and liberalism end up not delivering the promised land. But what they do is they end up delivering for a very small elite who become the elites. And through 
1990s to 2000s, the elites are doing very, very well. Then you get the 2008 financial shock. Suddenly the narrative begins to change. The story begins to change. The average dude who's carrying all this stuff and is suffering from the China shock Mm. and has expectations that he's going to be rich, but he doesn't have a stake, they suddenly say, hold on a second, it's that elite that is the problem. And country by country, slowly but surely, you see people lurching back to the protection of the flag, of nationalism, of the tribe. So it begins with Le Pen in France, Le Pen Sr., mm. and then Marine Le Pen. Yeah. Then in Italy, almost out of nothing, the Italian Northern League comes up, now the Italian League, and Salvini is in power. In Poland, you see a shift to the extreme right, yeah. very liberal. In Hungary, in Germany, the AFD, the alternative for Deutschland, they've now got 12%. Mm. And of course, in Britain, it manifests as Brexit. Is a nationalist movement saying, we're going to protect you from these horrible Europeans and take back control. Think of even the slogan, take back control. It's not even take back control from the Europeans. It's take back control from the elite, take back control from the city, take back control from London, etc. All the while, Ireland is going more and more liberal when the rest of the world is going more and more illiberal. We have referendums on abortion, on divorce... The leader of Ireland is a gay Indian, some of an immigrant, you know, that would never have happened when we were kids. So the long-term implication of the fall of the Berlin Wall has been the rise of fascism in countries that expected to be rich and never really got there, and the rise of liberalism in a country that expected always to be poor. I hope you enjoy that. Before we let you go, here's uh, some of our premium content. And don't forget that on Thursday week, that's November the 28th, in Vicker Street in Dublin, Gian and I and JM will be live for the inaugural David McWilliams podcast, which is the final, final show of the Dublin Podcast Festival. Tickets are at Ticketmaster. They're going incredibly quickly. So get in. If you, as they say, if you're not in, you can't win. And we'll all see you face to face Thursday week. Peter Frankenbein, ladies and gentlemen. That one of the ways that the Chinese are trying to work that out is to say, we're going to do the Belt and Road Initiative. We're going to rebuild the Silk Roads that's going to allow other people to connect into this happy world where all of us in Asia get along with each other because we don't have problems about religion and division and corporations. So we won't mention the Uyghurs and so on. The Chinese, they don't, they edit that bit out. But they try to create a structure to say we're stable and Europe and the West has always been difficult and dangerous. And I think we need to confront, there's some, there's some truth in that and we now need to start working out what is our reply, what's our response. If you enjoyed that, you can hear the full episode and much more by joining us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. See ya.